And now in peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. O God of life, you reach out to us amid our fears with the wounded hands of your risen Son, Jesus. By your Spirit's breath, revive our faith in your mercy and strengthen us to be the body of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever, and in whose name we do pray. Amen. I invite you to be seated as we turn to the appointed scriptures for this second Sunday in Easter. During the season of Easter, our first readings always somewhat uncharacteristically come from the book of Acts. Here in chapter 5, the early church has received the Holy Spirit. They've gotten that mission and ministry in Jerusalem. And lo and behold, they've uh, discovered that not everybody is happy that Jesus has been raised from the dead. The church, in other words, meets resistance pretty early on in its life and ministry. The first reading is from the fifth chapter of Acts, verses 27 through 32. When they had brought the apostles, they had them stand before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teachings, and you are determined to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him in his right hand as leader and savior, that he might give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. So in the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey, the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to God. God. We turn now to our second reading, which today comes from the book of Revelation. During the season of Easter, we always hear from one of the letters of the New Testament. This year, uh, that appointed letter is Revelation. And in these early verses, we hear a biblical background for something we Lutherans have always taught. We Lutherans have always taught that we're all priests, that every believer is a priest, uh, that you don't have to wear one of these to be a priest. And indeed, you hear that in this reading where we're told we've all been freed by Christ so that we might be, can you get it out? Priests. Yep, right here. The second reading is from the first chapter of Revelations, verses 4 through 8. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and frees us from our sins by his blood, and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion, forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to to God. God. 
I now invite you to rise for and greet the gospel with me, if you're so able, so inspired. Alleluia. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Alleluia. Our reading this second Sunday in Easter is the same. It is every second Sunday in Easter. We never get a different reading on this Sunday. Always this reading from John chapter 20, where we hear that the resurrection has not been a panacea, uh, that there are still plenty of issues on the other side of it. The Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my fingers in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I shall certainly not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe." Thomas answered, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you to be seated. Well, if you wanted a storybook ending, you don't get one. If you want a happy ending, you don't get one. You might have left here last week thinking all the problems of the world were solved. Jesus had been raised from the dead. Everything was a okay and then you get to today, and you come to understand that's not the case. In today's reading from John, the reading we get every single solitary second Sunday of Easter, is there faith? Is there hope? Is there love? All the good stuff we'd like to see on the other side of Easter? Not. What you've got is fear. What you've got are disciples not out and about sharing the love of Jesus, out and about doing mission and ministry, but locked up behind closed doors. Then you've got Thomas. Uh, we like to call him Doubting Thomas. I had a professor at seminary who insisted he's disbelieving Thomas. We won't get into all that, but uh, you've got fear, you've got locked doors, you've got doubt, you've got disbelief. Disbelief. My, oh my, I guess resurrection reality and our perception are not the same thing. There evidently was a reason that even before his death and resurrection, Jesus taught us to pray, Our Father, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I don't know if we think about it when we pray those words, but they suggest pretty strongly that there can be a disconnect between what's going on in heaven and what's going on in earth. Evidently, there can be a disconnect between God and humankind, between the saint and sinner in us, between perception and reality, between word and deed. Those words, 
our Father, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, suggest we can be guilty of a certain schizophrenia in the practice of our faith. It's not that way up in heaven. In heaven, every knee now bends at the name of Jesus, and every tongue confesses Jesus as Lord. That's heaven. It's probably always that way, but if there were doubts about Jesus at one point in heaven, the resurrection, the ascension, the being seated at the right hand of the Father has put them to bed forever. But what about down here on earth? Are all the doubts and the fears and all the disbelief related to Jesus gone by? Voila, not Got home last night from church, and my wife said, how'd it go? And I said, well, kind of light, kind of light attendance-wise. And she said, well, yeah, it's low church Sunday. Oh, we, we come to accept that we have these big, marvelous celebrations on Easter weekend, and then the next weekend, <laughs> uh, not every knee bends at the name of Jesus down here on earth. The book of Revelation says eventually all the doubters, all the disbelievers, all the hesitant, all the haters, eventually they're going to wail when Jesus is seen coming in the clouds, but we're not there yet. And so there are still a fair amount of people down here on earth that do not use their lives to confess Jesus as Lord. And are we guilty of that sometimes ourselves, not using our lives to confess Jesus as Lord? Yep. Again, we understand why even before his death and resurrection, Jesus was teaching us to pray, Our Father, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's probably no coincidence that we pray those words when we're together. The Lord's Prayer, we can use it individually, but it's not really built for individual use. Oh, all the language is plural. The Lord's Prayer is meant primarily for praying together. And our reading from John tells us that togetherness is kind of an important thing when it comes to overcoming our fears, our doubts, our disbelief. Where are the disciples when Jesus comes the first time and says, peace be with you, peace be with you, receive the Holy Spirit? Are they living separate, individual lives, or are they together? They are together. Next week, when Thomas is with them and Jesus comes again to give peace and inspiration and the like, are the disciples off in their individual places, or are they together? Together. To skip towards to the end of the season of Easter, when we get to Pentecost Sunday, when the Holy Spirit descends, are the disciples in their separate zip codes, or are they together? Together. This suggests pretty strongly that somehow, some way, these mutual gatherings, these mutual times of prayer and worship overcome some or a good bit of what gets in the way of us enacting God's will on earth as it's already being enacted in heaven. Evidently, these encounters can be transformative, leave us stronger in our faith than we were before we came. And how is that so? How are these encounters transformative? I don't want to be too limiting in my answer to that question, but again, let's think about the Lord's Prayer and where it's situated in the service. Do you have the Lutheran liturgy memorized by this point? Do you know its movements? Do you know where the Lord's Prayer is always prayed? It's always prayed right before our Lord Jesus comes to us at the table of Holy Communion through, through grape and grain. How comforting this coming can be. How reassuring this coming can be. How electrifying this coming can be. 
I'd suggest to you that Holy Communion today is the modern day equivalent of that Easter burst of Easter truth and Easter power the disciples got when Jesus walked through their fears, their locked doors, their doubt, their disbelief to come to them. In Holy Communion, God shows up and says, you three are here again, and I'm here again too. I'm going nowhere. Now, it's true we can receive a burst of Easter power, Easter inspiration, Easter truth throughout other portions of the service. That's why I didn't want to be too limiting earlier. Certainly, Jesus can speak to us through the Word and calm us down and inspire us by saying, peace be with you, Bill Layton. This will all pass. But there's a reason that for most of the church's history, the mountaintop experience, the climax, the highlight of worship was always considered to be communion. Luther said that's not quite right. It's the sermon and communion. They're both equally important. But for 1,500 years prior to Luther, communion was the undisputed highlight, the undisputed mountaintop experience of worship. And why is that? Well, if Jesus speaks to us from afar through his word, he gets up close and personal through the sacrament of Holy Communion, saying, Carm, here I am. I'm raised from the dead, never to die again. Don't fret, don't fear. I'm not going anywhere. I got your back. Now let my Father's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. But as we give communion its appropriate kudos, we do have to ask, how do we do that? How do we do God's will on earth as it is in heaven? What, at the end of the day, is God's will for our lives? Still ready to take over, Ray? Okay. Okay, nine, yes. Sprechen Sie Deutsch, bitte. Well, let's get our language correct. God's will is not a what. God's will is a who. A who named Jesus Christ. Anything you want to know about God's will for your life? It's right there in Jesus Christ. You do what Jesus would do. You do what God the Father wants you to do. Go out and do what Jesus would do. That's how you enact God's, God the Father's will on earth as it is in heaven. And one thing I'd point out to you this morning about Jesus is that he's not schizophrenic. Jesus is not one foot in and one foot out. Jesus is not, hello there, uh, do it on Monday, not on Tuesday. Jesus is all in all the time. There's no conflict between his humanity and his divinity. His, these aspects of his, of his identity are not at war. They're at peace, complementing and supporting one another. But what about us? Are the various aspects of our identity always at peace with one another, always supporting one another, always complementing one another, or can they be at war? They can be at war. Yes, Austin, there you are, as always. Very smart young man. The reality is we can not only have split personality, we can have triple personality, quadruple personality, quintuple personality, and I don't know how to say six in a fancy way. So we'll stop uh, right there. We can be all over the map in terms of the various aspects <coughs> of our identity. No integration at all. And if Jesus, the perfectly integrated one, is God's will for our lives, might we want to get a little less schizophrenic? Might we become, want to become a little less split, a little less splintered, 
a little less one foot in, one foot out. Yep. But I'd suggest to you this morning that might be particularly tough for us Americans. We're used to compartmentalizing things. We have this principle we call the separation of church and state. That's a good principle. The religious liberty of all should be respected and not trampled upon. But what often happens is that faith becomes this private, purely personal thing that never shows up anywhere else in our lives. Is that good? It's not. That's the very definition of schizophrenia, of a splintered personality. In church, we say, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. And then, for the rest of the week, we say, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. Except it's something else that we're saying we believe. We're too used to putting church in this little box and the rest of our lives in a much larger box with the two not in conversation at all. Is that good or is that bad? It's very bad. Sometimes we don't even think about it. We say, ah, that's church. This is the rest of my life. No correlation between the two. Not good. And when we do recognize the disconnect, here's what we do sometimes. We try to cover our tracks by getting the Bible to say not what it says, but what we want it to say. You ever know anybody like that who, rather than dealing with what the Bible has to say, tries to warp it so that it supports the way they want to lead their lives? Happens all the time, folks, and it's happening a lot these days. I hear things in the news from supposedly Christian people, and I think to myself, what Bible are you reading? It's bad. But just because everybody else is doing it doesn't mean we should do it. Did your parents ever tell you that? Just because everybody else is doing it doesn't mean you should do it. Hawkins Smith boys look like, looks like you've gotten that treatment at home, huh? Well, I got it many times growing up. Yes, my house, my rules. Oh, uh, God's got the same message for us. And here's the bottom line. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no way to the Father except through him. Jesus is the will of God for our lives. And Jesus is not a verse. He's not a paragraph. He's not a chapter. Jesus is a person. And you can't take little pieces of people and leave the rest somewhere else. You either take the whole person or not the person not at all. It's what the disciples do in our reading from Acts today. The muckety-mucks say, you better be a little quieter about this Jesus thing. Bill, I see you got a CD there. You got too many Jesus anthems on it. Turn that down. That's what they say. And what do they say in return? Forget it. You want us to leave some or part of Jesus behind. We're not doing it. We're bringing them all along, and we are not going to bend to any human authority that is in conflict with what God has revealed through the resurrection of his son. Isn't that the way it's supposed to go? Integration. Not one little box over here and then the rest of our lives. Integration. Jesus always at the center. Is that the goal? Jesus out of the margins and at the center. I think it is the goal. And so, if you want it to be a smart aleck, you might say to me, okay, Klimke, we've heard you. Jesus is the revealed will of God. We do what God would want us to do when we do what Jesus would do. But what does Jesus want us to do? 
He's good to you, Gladdy. I'm glad to to you. Yeah, good to you. Good, good to hear that. Well, I can't answer that question in one little soundbite, but here's what I would share with you this morning. Generally speaking, what Jesus is always doing is bringing outsiders in. That seems to be Jesus, Jesus' modus operandi, the one he wants us to adopt and apply ourselves. Look for the outsiders and bring them in. Think about what happens in this text from John chapter 20. When we start out, those ten disciples minus Thomas, are they in or are they out when it comes to faith, hope, and love? to the church. They're out. Now Jesus could have said, well, a few hours earlier, Mary Magdalene came to belief. She's all I need. I'll leave these other ten behind. Is that what Jesus does? Nope. He shows up with his peace. He shows up with his Holy Spirit. And these ten who are on the outside are brought in. Now what about Thomas? Thomas. Here we're talking about just one person, not ten. Jesus very easily could have said, ah, I've got Mary Magdalene, I've got the ten, I've got all the people of Christian faith and belief who are to come and future generations, I don't need Thomas. I'll leave him on the outside. Is that what Jesus does, leave Thomas out? He doesn't. Again, he shows back up and the outsider is brought in. I'd suggest to you more often than not, that's what Jesus is up to. He's finding the outsider and bringing them in the middle. Let's just run through a couple of examples. Lepers, they're sick people, they're banned from human society in Old Testament times. These are the true outsiders, if there ever was an outsider. Does Jesus allow them to live on the outside forever? No. He heals them and brings them in. Blind people, does Jesus allow them to remain blind forever? Or does he heal them and bring them in? Heals them and brings them in. I think of Dee and her love for bowling. She recently told me that she gave up bowling. Well, you bowl too long, you might end up lame. Oh, and uh, I almost did end up lame once. I was a real dummy. My dad had his bowling ball in a bucket down in the basement, and I took the bowling ball out of the bucket, put it on his workbench, and took the bucket. And before I had moved a foot with the bucket, what do you think happened to the bowling ball? Right on my foot. Smashed the living daylights out of it. You bowl too often, you can end up as a paralytic. But does Jesus allow the paralytics to remain outside, or does he bring them in? He brings them in. What about those people with demons? Does he allow them to remain on the outside, or does he bring them in? He brings them in. What about hated people like the Samaritans? Does Jesus allow them to remain out, or does he bring them in? He brings them in. What about women who at the time of the Bible had no social safety net? Does Jesus leave these women on the outs? Or does he bring him in? Brings him in. Do you hear it? This is Jesus' modus operandi, the one he wants us to adopt. Look for outsiders, bring him in. Jesus goes to such great lengths to do this that he says before his cross and empty tomb, I'm going where you can't go. I'm going where you wouldn't go. And I'm going there that I might prepare a place for you in the Father's house where you otherwise would have been persona non grata. You know what he's doing there? Outsider in. And so, you want to do what Jesus would have you do? Whether it's at home, away from home, whether it's publicly, whether it's privately, look for outsiders and bring them Look for outsiders and bring them. It's how the will of God is done down here as well as up there. Amen? Good.
invite the congregation to be seated, and I would invite our kids forward to see what was in the mysterious bag and whether or not I was telling the truth about it. Come on up, Gabriel and Claire and Malia. All right. So we'll, we'll just fill the grown-ups in. You know, we, we heard the story uh, about Thomas and, and Thomas who, who didn't believe uh, about Jesus in, until he, he got to see him for real. And we talked a little bit already about, you know, sometimes it, it's hard to believe. You know, sometimes people tell you stories and, and you're not sure whether or not they're telling the truth. So let, let's talk about some of the stories we, we heard today. I told you I was wearing pink socks, right? Yeah? Was I, was I actually wearing pink socks? No. Say that real loud, Malia. Was I wearing pink socks? No. No. What, what color socks was I wearing? Um, you were wearing... Uh, you were wearing... Let's see. Black. Black. Yep. You know, and, and you could see that once you, you looked. And, and as soon as I told you I was wearing pink socks, you know, Gabriel was, was kind of peering under the table to, to take a look and see what my socks looked like. And, and after a minute or so, you were all kind of looking to see what my socks looked like because you wanted to see whether I was really wearing pink socks. And, and I wasn't. You know, sometimes people tell you stories that, that aren't true. We talked a little bit of, about, you know, Malia, who, who were we talking about that was big and brown that you thought could help us with, with the balloon stuck in the, the fan? Bigfoot, you know, and, and we, we said that, that we'd want to see Bigfoot to actually believe in him, right? You know, we, we'd want to see him walk into church or, or something like that to, to know that he was real because sometimes we just want to see. Bigfoot. Bigfoot is far away on top of the mountain hiding in the forest. So, then I pulled out this bag, you know, a, a normal brown paper Aldi grocery bag, and what did I tell you guys was inside the bag? You know, <laughs> what, what, what did I say was inside it, Claire? Do you remember? Say it loud. A fox? What kind of fox? A chubby fox. I said the chubbiest fox that they had ever seen was inside this bag. And, and did you guys believe me? So Malia, Malia thought I was telling the truth. Claire, you, you thought I was lying, didn't you? And, and Gabriel, you, you weren't really sure. You, you were thinking maybe there's a fox, but maybe not, right? So let's see what is inside. We'll see. That it might be a very important thing inside this. It, is this not the chubbiest fox you've ever seen? It, this, this belongs to my little girl, Annabelle. So she, she would probably be sad if it, it didn't come back home. But it, I was telling the truth, wasn't I? No, but, but seeing the fox, you're, you're a little bit more willing to believe that, that I don't always lie, right? You, you knew there was really a fox in here. So next time, if next week I tell you that I'm wearing pink socks again, you know, do you think I'll be telling the truth or do you think I'll be lying? We'll, we'll have to see, right? You know, and, and that... That's what today's story is all about, reminding us that, that sometimes it is okay to not believe something unless you see it. You know, and, and God, hang on one second. So God, you know, we don't always get to see God, but we can still believe in God. Just like some of you believed in me and believed in the chubby fox, even though you hadn't seen it yet. We... We can still believe in God, even though we, we don't always get to see him 
the, the way that we see our moms or dads or, or puppies or kitties. Um, we don't always see Bigfoot, but we, we still might believe in him, too. Yep. So let's bow our heads and fold our hands, and let's say a prayer together. So, dear God, uh, you remind us that, that sometimes it, it's hard to believe without seeing, but, but we know that, that you exist even though we, we don't always get to see you. And, and we're so happy that, that Jesus showed himself to Thomas and, and to all of the other disciples so, so that all of us could believe that, that he rose from the dead. Uh, we ask that, that you keep us safe and, and help us to always know how much you love us and, and know that, that you're always with us, even though we, we don't always see you. We ask all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. All right, thank you guys. You can head on back with your families. And I, no, it's coming home with me. I, I would invite you all to, to stand as we continue our worship, probably with the Nicene, nope. Well, we'll continue with the prayers of intercession in just a moment. (laughs) Set free from captivity to sin and death, we pray to the God of resurrection for the church, for people in need, and for all of creation. Holy One who acts righteously, equip your church as witnesses of your goodness to go and tell others of your abundant love, that they may believe that Jesus is our salvation and our life. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Renew your people's commitment to use resources responsibly and to live well with your creation. Invite us to recognize and nurture signs of resurrection life in the natural world. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Direct those who are given human authority to lead with humility and compassion. By your Holy Spirit, channel their attention towards serving those who are most in need. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Uphold your children who cry out to you, especially those we name in our prayer list and those we name aloud and in our hearts before you now. Whenever people are overcome by fear of death or any fear at all, Breathe into them your life and your peace. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In spite those who lead your people in worship and praise, especially all of the art and music ministries of this congregation, with joyful motion and sound, send us forth with praise that we cannot keep to ourselves. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us the words of your saints who, like Thomas, boldly confessed your Son as Lord and God. With Jesus, our leader, empower us to live according to his ways. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In your mercy, O God, respond to these prayers and renew us by your life-giving Spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Let's share a sign of that peace with one another. for you then. Uh, I got the pleasant news uh, last night, last week rather, that Katie and Ben here in the back row, uh, Malia's parents, are getting married. Yeah, can we say congratulations? Yeah, yeah. I did make it down to Pittsburgh uh, this week again to see our sister Becky Lilia. She has been uh, having a difficult time coming back from Uh, a growth removal procedure on her brain. Uh, I did find things much, much better this week, however, so that was encouraging. She's no longer attached to any monitors or or things like that, and they're doing their best to find a place in our area that can give her the care that she requires. Uh, She is receiving a couple of kind of technical things, so that's holding up the the transfer a bit. But there definitely was progress, uh, and that was uh, good to see. Some of you have been wanting to know if there's anything you can do for Becky. I did ask her that question uh, directly 
And she said, uh, she said, no, not at this time. Uh, and others of you have asked about how you might get a card to Becky. If you simply look up uh, the address for uh, Presbyterian Hospital in Pittsburgh, I believe it's 200 Lothrop Street, uh, but you could uh, find it very easily. Just look up Presbyterian Hospital, and then you would send a card to that address, and then you'd write on it, Becky Lilia, 8D, 8D, Becky Lilia, 8D. We uh, did have a funeral service for Claire Barker this past uh, Thursday. Uh, his wife Florence had only died a couple of months ago, so you run into those couples that uh, simply can't be apart, and we celebrate that they're now together again in the mystery of the resurrection. We've been collecting funds all uh, Lent and Easter long for our Good Gifts campaign. This is a campaign where when you go out in the narthex, you see a tree-like object, you remove an envelope, there's an item that someone needs abroad, could be uh, a beehive, could be a motorbike for a missionary, could be a vacation Bible school set. You remove it and uh, you contribute the corresponding amount and it all goes there. Thus far, we have raised $4,700, $4,700 for this year's Good Gift campaign. It's pretty nice, huh? Question is, get it to around five. Can we get it to around five? Can it go ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching? Three ka-chings, 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 gets us to around five. We'll see whether it happens or not. We're appreciative of everything you've done, so uh, thank you for that. Uh, we are a little behind the eight ball here on a project, uh, and that's getting Senate Assembly delegates uh, selected and registered. For whatever reason, they set uh, this year's registration date on April 15th. Now, do you remember what was happening on April 15th? It's Good Friday. Do you think most of the preachers in the Senate, congregations in the Senate, were involved with uh, things other than Senate Assembly delegates on the 15th? We were, oh, <laughs> so we need to find those delegates, uh, so here's what we can do, it's a one day thing, it's June 11th, you do it online from 9 to 5, we can send up to two men, two women, one person under 30, and uh, one person of color. Uh, if we don't send all six this year, I don't think it's a huge deal, there aren't any major elections or anything happening, but uh, if you have an interest in being one of those delegates, you do need a computer uh, that, that you can use because uh, it's going to be done through Zoom, uh, let me know. We'll get you lined up. And then finally, I hesitate to announce my vacations because uh, I have learned uh, for a long, long time now when the preacher says he's going to be away, what do you think people do? They stay at home, oh, which isn't fair at all, oh, to the people who are left behind. But I am going to be away for two weeks, so I thought I would uh, let you know this time that I will be away for the next two weeks. In June, Julia and I will celebrate our 20th wedding anniversary, and we're taking an anniversary trip to celebrate that. We'll be in Arizona for about a week, Las Vegas, oh, for a weekend. She did ask me to get two rolls of quarters. I don't know what that's, uh, that's about. Uh, and then a week in California. Oh, uh, So we leave tomorrow, and uh, we'll be back, back in mid-May. So uh, Pastor Jonathan will be here uh, handling things in my, in my absence. So that's it for my announcements. Do you have any to add or share yourselves?